thank you, Professor Warnick, for that uh, overly generous introduction. The, the one thing that uh, I will underscore is I am a BYU guy through and through, and I'll explain a little bit um, the one deviation from that here in a second. It really is good to be with you. Uh, people ask quite often what my favorite part of the university is, and it's a stock answer, but it's true. And I said that's being with students. Um, students really are the lifeblood of the university. That's the reason the university exists. And for most of you, uh, you'll underappreciate the impact that you have on people who come here on campus. Quite frequently, um, and it's a little sporadic, but I would guess maybe 15 times a year, I meet with ambassadors from foreign countries that we Im invite here. And it's interesting to see them try and explain what they feel when they come here. Most of them don't have the vocabulary to explain it, but they, they say there's something about the students, there's something about your campus, there's something, and it usually comes back to the students. Why are they so happy? Why, one, one wanted to know if we had a happiness initiative here on this campus because everyone was saying hello to them. And I said, no, that's just who they are. Uh, but I want to thank you for who you are and thank you for being here today, uh, both in the sense of showing up for class. I realize you get credit for this, uh, but also for being here on this campus and for the kind of lives you lead that led you to being here. And in each instance, I don't know what the story is, but there is a story about why you're here and that story will unfold as you uh, not only are here, but as you go out into the world. And a story I don't think you'll fully know the full meaning of until you're on the other side of the veil and the impact you've had. Um, this is a leadership class, and they asked me to talk something about leadership, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I think is one of the best leadership books that I've read, and it's called Counseling with Counsels by Elder M. Russell Ballard. Now, most people won't think of that as a leadership book in, in the world, uh, but I've come to find out, and this will be a little bit autobiographical, about how I find out how important gospel principles are, and then also the way in which they apply in our everyday setting. So first, how we learn how important gospel principles are. Uh, and this is the autobiographical part about me, um, about how I learn things, because this is the reverse order in which I think you're supposed to learn them. I first started thinking about councils in a little different way because of basketball. Um, I grew up, and that was my, my sole focus in life, was to be a basketball player. And the one time that I was not a BYU guy is I actually turned down a full academic scholarship at BYU because I wanted to play basketball, and I was not good enough to play basketball at BYU. I could play at a junior college level. I realized that. I had a couple of scholarships offers and went to junior college and played basketball. Now, that's a long time ago. To give you an idea how long ago it was, when I played, there were no three-point shots. There was no such thing. <laughs> It was against the rules, and this was true in college basketball for about an eight-year period of time. There were, there, it was against the rules to dunk during the, during the game. You actually got a technical foul, and that's, that's the excuse I now use for why I didn't dunk more often in college. <laughs> there were some other reasons that were really underlined that, but th that's the excuse I use now. You've probably seen pictures. The shorts were a lot shorter. Sorry, I didn't, you know, I didn't invent these. They just <laughs> were that way. But one of the things that happened is during a timeout, whenever there was a timeout, the instructions were pretty clear. As a player, you were to get to the bench as quickly as you could and sit down because the coach was going to start talking. This was a 60-second interval in which the coach could finally get a hold of the chaos that was going on on the, field, on the court, because otherwise he had no control at all. I mean, he could yell, but, you know, the players do whatever they want to do. And, and, but during timeouts, that was a precious 60-second interval in which the coach would cram as much information as he could into what he wanted you to be doing out there and used all 60 seconds. It's still true today. You watch in most basketball games. Usually the referee has to come and get them out of the timeout. They don't, they don't disband. Every once in a while they do it. Most of the time, they're up there using all of this time as quickly as they can. And again, it's, it's to the bench, coach would talk. Now, through the years, some of you will view this if you really watch a lot of basketball and pay attention to such trivia. You will notice that's not what happens now. Now, the players do come to the bench immediately and sit down. But the coach does not, head coach does not start talking to them immediately. Somebody out there, because this is going to be a little participatory here, even more so in just a few minutes. What is the first thing that the coach does when a timeout is called? Who does he talk with? Assistants, assistant coaches. Assistant coaches. And it's almost invariably the case now. They're going to talk to their assistant coaches. Now, the first time I saw this happen, and it's now been about 20 years ago, I was almost you know, type A personality. I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're wasting time. You, know, you can figure out where you're going to eat after the game some other time. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, don't do this. And then I started seeing it happen more frequently and started asking coaches, what are you doing? 
Well, the thing that happened, and it's uh, those who watch a lot of basketball, this will not be news to. The very first thing the coach, head coach does is he got an assistant who's in charge of offense and an assistant who's in charge of defense. And he wants to know what they are seeing and what is the most important thing they ought to give by way of instruction to the players before they actually go in and start launching this because the head coach can't see everything. And they will take, and again, type A personality, as this first started happening, I started you know, timing. How much time are you spending out there talking to each other instead of to the players? And it's not unusual, although it's not, it's not the majority, but it's not unusual to have more than half the time spent talking to each other. Of a minute, there'll be 30 seconds together. Usually it's about 15 or 20, but it'll be 30 seconds together and sometimes more before they even go talk to the players. Now, at that point, I started thinking, huh, is this worth it? And you see it as a trend. It started off a little unusual. It is now the norm. It is rare that that doesn't happen now. And the reason for that is because what they're really doing is counseling with each other before they decide on what is the most important thing to do. Now, as I say, this is autobiographical in the wrong reason, but then I started paying more attention in church lessons when I heard about counseling because I thought, you know, this applies to basketball as well. Uh, now it's really important stuff. It's usually the other way around you want it to happen is figure out something in, in, in the gospel context that applies in your own individual life. But for me, that's when it first started taking on meaning. And it was some years after that, oh, I guess maybe five or six after that, that the first edition of Counseling with Councils came out by Elder Ballard. And read that, and it sort of changed, in a sense, leadership, my leadership thinking, because part of the reason I, that I recognize that's what's going on with councils is not some earthly, temporary kind of function that we perform now in order to get us through our mortal existence. That I really firmly believe that counseling and counseling with counsels is an eternal celestial skill set. That is, we won't be done with this when we go on to the next phase of our existence. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, we think about what we do know is it predated this earthly existence. We talk about the grand council in heaven that we're familiar with and there's scriptural reference to. The fact that we call that the grand council in heaven suggests that there are other councils in heaven. Just linguistically, if there was only one, you'd, you'd just refer it to as the council in, in the pre-earth life. But it's a grand council and I suggest that there were some things that happened, uh, other kind of counseling that went into that. As proof of that, if you, if you, if you go to Abraham 26, you don't have to turn there now, it says, the gods took counsel among themselves and said, let us go down and form man in our image after our likeness. They took counsel among themselves. If you then go over to Abraham 5, this is describing the creation again, listen to the language. The gods said among themselves on the seventh time, we will end our work which we have counseled, and we will rest on the seventh time from all our work which we have counseled. Verse 3. The gods concluded upon the seventh time because that on the seventh time they would rest from all their works which they, the gods, counseled among themselves. Thus were their decisions at the time that they counseled among themselves to form the heavens and the earth. It's pretty clear that as part of the creative process there was counseling going on on an ongoing basis. It wasn't just here's the instructions, go do it. There was counseling. Uh, it's interesting enough, in fact, when, when God describes himself among, it's not the very first time, but when he describes himself to Enoch the prophet in the Pearl of Great Price, he said, behold, I am God, man of holiness is my name. Now that's one we're a little bit more familiar with, that God calls himself man of holiness. When we talk about the Savior being the son of man, it is really just short shorthand for the son of man of holiness. It's not that he was the son of a mortal, it really is the son of man of holiness. But listen to what he says, Behold, I am God, man of holiness is my name, man of counsel is my name, endless and eternal is my name also. So I started thinking, this is again, he's describing himself, he's a man of holiness, he's, he's endless, he's eternal, and he is a man of counsel. And that's why I started thinking again that this is an eternal kind of skill set that we ought to develop. One of the reasons we're here on earth life is to, to develop those celestial skill sets so that we'll be able to fulfill the full measure of our creation, become like Heavenly Father, and he is a person of counsel. And we ought to learn how to counsel with one another. Now, um, how, does this, how does this all help? This is where you're going to start participating, I hope. Start thinking about this construct of counseling with counsels 
in not only in that celestial setting, but in an earthly setting and thinking about leadership and working with leaders. What is it about councils that is so important that we gain from counseling with each other in a council setting? I'll give you a little bit of time to, 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 to think about that, but that's what I want to explore. Think about this, that Heavenly Father, it would have been easy enough for him simply to say, look, do it. Here's how you do it. I, I think he had it all figured out, but yet he's counseling throughout the whole process and allowing councils to go on, obviously for some benefit from that. And this is the part of, again, where hopefully the lecture, when I say, you know, counseling with councils, we can start saying, how does this apply in a leadership context, even outside the church context? You know, what are the benefits from this outside, and you can use an example inside the church context as well, but one that might apply if you're a leader of an organization or anything else. And, and, and again, last one before I start asking for your response, I very much believe in councils, and this is not novel to me, but at, at the university level, as president, we have a president's council. It's made up of the vice, pres vice presidents and heads of various areas on campus, and we meet every Monday, and, and we counsel together. I then meet one-on-one -on -one with each member of that council uh, every week for an hour, but we do counseling, and I've seen the benefits from this, but I'm now interested, now I'm the part, hopefully you've had a time to think, what are the benefits of counseling together? Please. You learn from each other different perspectives and different ideas. Okay, you learn from each other and different perspectives and different ideas. There's actually a couple of things in that. You learn different perspectives, this, this will be obvious, but, but why do you learn different perspectives? Everyone sees differently. Everyone sees differently, and, and we're all individually different. And that is true in an internal sense as well. I believe we're not, we're not going to be automatons in the next in the celestial kingdom. We will have our individual identities that may be part of what our individual intelligence is. But there, there will be individuals and we will maybe see things differently on some aspects. And that certainly is true here. And that's why you have different perspectives and you can learn from each other. So number one, you have a broader base, let's say, of both experiences and of ideas. Other ideas? Please, right there. Okay, so you get all, all I'm, I'm repeating this so that the people who you know, watch this afterwards know what you say. So you get all on the same team, and say that again in terms of the end, because there's, a, there's another point there in terms of... Um, so, everyone owns so everyone owns it, instead of just one individual owning it. There's two concepts there that, that I think are applicable. Number one, you can achieve a, a level of unity by involving people in a council, and I'll, we'll come back to that one. And number two, there's a level of ownership, I like that, or exhilaration that comes from that. Do people, are you more likely to be excited about a project if you've had input in it? I, I don't think there's any question. If it becomes, if you start owning it, that's a very good term. If it's part of your, you're part of it, you have more of a stake in seeing it happen. And that's another thing that happens with councils. Other ideas? Please. I think in terms of like Heavenly Father and his council, or even Christ and the apostles, the meeting with the council allows the council to grow and become leaders in the future as well. Okay, so it develops future leaders. And to use, again, in the secular term, it's a good way to have succession planning, giving them insights into everything, a larger picture than the, just their portfolio, again, to use the, 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 the secular terms. So they see a bigger picture, and they learn different skill sets that prepare them to become the leaders. And in any organization, any organization, succession planning is a really good idea. I mean, you don't think about it the whole time you're there, but thinking about who would take my place and how do you develop people so that they can be even better at doing my job than I am at that. Counseling helps you, gives you an opportunity to do that. Other thoughts? Enlarge the leader's capabilities. Yes, so enlarge the leader's, and I'll use the singular, the, the, the one who's heading the council capabilities in which way? Yep. In other words, it magnifies his impact, his or her impact, on the whole organization because you're now not just doing everything yourself. Most of you will be, again, and, and you'll see me sort of going back and forth to the Sunday school lesson and the, the leadership lesson in, for, for, for engineering and other kinds of things, global leadership. But think about the example in, in, in Moses chapter eight, excuse me, Exodus chapter 18 with Moses and delegation. 
I think we're familiar with this, that Moses was doing everything himself. His father-in-law came to him and said, stop doing that. There's actually two reasons why Moses' his father told him to stop doing that. One, I think, is better known than the other. The one that's, that's really well known is Jethro says to Moses in verse 18, Thou will surely wear away both thou and this people, for this thing is too heavy for thee, thou art not able to perform it thyself. In other words, if you try doing everything yourself, you are not going to be very successful because you're just limited. You only have 24 hours in a day and your energy, and that's it, and you're going to wear out and not get everything done. But if you go up to verse 14, it's the point made of, earlier about developing leaders. Uh, Moses' father-in-law, the first thing he says is to him, he says, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said to Moses, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? The focus wasn't then on that Moses was going to burn out, the original focus. It was, you're hurting this people. You're depriving them of an opportunity to grow themselves, to receive inspiration for themselves, to lead leadership training by themselves, because you're doing everything by yourself, and the, first, the greatest harm is going to be on them. Not that you're just going to wear out Moses, which is part of it, but the earlier point as well comes from that, saying, Moses, you're, you're doing this the wrong way, and people are, it's going to affect them adversely. Not just because things don't get done, but they don't have the opportunity. So, other thoughts? Have we surveyed the field? Any other thoughts about why counseling together is helpful? Stemming off of what we were just talking about, is there some kind of synergy happening in counseling? So <coughs> the total product is greater than what each individual is contributing. Okay, I was about to ask you, you know, for, for us non-technical types, what synergy is, and you just gave the answer, which is? The, greater, the total product is greater than what each individual can be. The, the total product is greater than what each individual can be. And I believe, again, that's... I think it is an eternal concept that you can build on in terms of organizations. You really will start thinking differently. Everyone will start thinking differently because of this counseling, and they will be enhanced in ways on their own they never would have. Please. Yep. Did everyone hear that? Yeah, again, 2 Nephi, this is 6. It's also in Isaiah. I think he may be quoting Isaiah. And it introduced Christ, and his names are, his name shall be called Wonderful, second one, Counselor, the Mighty God. Go ahead now. Yep, and the Mighty God. Yep. Yes, and, and, and I'm trying to think again for those who are going to be watching on the internet, because th this is so good. Uh, in terms of counseling, Christ is a counselor. And there's several aspects of it, and, and I may distort this a little bit. But one has to do with our agency. That is, he's going to counsel us. He'll teach us. He'll, 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 he'll entice us. He'll explain things. He's not going to force anything. He's not a puppet master who sort of just controls us. It really is this idea that he is a counselor, and that's how we get benefit from counseling with him and from modeling him as a counselor as we interact with other people. As, as was stated by training, I'm a lawyer. They get called a lot of things. <laughs> and in fact, there's a lot of titles for them. You think about it, attorney at law, lawyer. The one I always liked was counselor. And that's one of the terms that's used for them. Now, again, some instances doesn't apply all that way if you know particular lawyers, but there are, there are various people. It could be advocate, everything else, but, but, but I like the one of counselor because there is something about that. Any other thoughts about benefits, please? Um, some, something I don't think has been mentioned yet is that as a council, when we can come together, the best ideas come out. Okay. That as a whole, when you come together, you, you lose yourself and find what's best. Okay. So, so that again, you just get improved decision-making overall because people get engaged at a different level, not only in the finished product that they own, but in the very process itself. And let me suggest, and this is very much applicable outside a church setting, 
because I think it's a universal truth, which is inspiration will come more readily through counseling. And that is one, again, that is not just limited to, you know, we prayed about it and we're in the church council. It will happen wherever because the Holy Ghost, as its scriptures make clear, is the teacher of all truth, period. There's no limitation on that. It's not just in Sunday school. It really is. Elder Bednar, I've heard say, the very best calculus teacher in the world is the Holy Ghost. And that's true. And so when you counsel together and it ins invites inspiration, invites the Holy Ghost there, there will be more learning and better answers come forth as a result of that. One more. Did I see one other hand? There you go. Especially, okay, let me, again, I have to remember, remind myself to repeat this. So that you can have members of the council who help you see your own short, shortcomings and weaknesses and blind spots that otherwise wouldn't happen that we, you can't see on your own. And, and you made the comment, you know, whether that applies to Heavenly Father or not, who knows everything, that's a good question. My guess is maybe not, but, but I hedge my bets just a little bit. Um, and, and we'll tell a story to... To, to illustrate this, uh, Monty Bruff, who was a general authority, uh, he's now passed away, but he at one time was in the area of presidency in Hong Kong. And I heard him describe a, a, an experience he had at which President and Sister Hinckley came to Hong Kong to, for some kind of meetings, I've forgotten what they were, and stayed in the home, in the Bruff home. They, that night, called on their 11-year-old daughter, the Bruffs did, to say the prayer. And she, as was their customer of the family, said, bless whoever else. But they get to the list and say, and bless President Hinckley and, you know, all those who work with him, something like that. When they stood up from the prayer, uh, Sister Hinckley, who had a wonderful sense of humor, said, why is it that everyone pay, prays for Gordon and nobody ever prays for me? <laughs> and just as you laughed, and Elder Bruff said, everybody sort of laughed and chuckled and thought, what a night. And she said, no, I'm serious. She said, there are certain things that I'm the only person on earth that can tell a prophet of God. After that, Elder Bruff said, we started praying for President Hinckley and Sister Hinckley. He said, because what she said was absolutely true. And that's dependent upon, and what counselors can create, a, a feeling of trust among people, that they don't feel vulnerable, that they don't feel defensive. That takes some work sometimes, depending on what the organization is like. But if you get a feeling of trust, and again, you know, those who study management, maybe you've heard this before, there's, you know, there's a book called The Speed of Trust and everything else. If you can get that going, that really speeds things up. And a council can allow that to happen and get the benefits from it. There was one other one right in the back. If you haven't lost your thought before, because we're going to go on. Yeah, please. Okay. I, I think, and there, well, I guess I ought to say both of these. One is, if the Holy Ghost is the teacher of all truth, why don't we just study by ourselves, right? And the second one is, what happens when you think you've had a confirmation, I guess, is that, that's what I want to say, about a secular truth, and it turns out to be false? Okay, let, let me address the, 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 the second one first, and then the, the first one I'll come back to councils and tie it into another one. You know, what you do is, is you say there may be some aspects of truth in it that may account for it. It may just be that we're not as good as we can be about discerning what the Spirit's teaching us there. So I think it is very possible we think, yeah, that's confirmed. And it may be even right for a particular time. I mean, the history facts are a little, don't fit that pattern quite as well. But, but what you may learn may be correct for that time and that setting and not be applicable somewhere else. 
and, and, and part of understanding the truth is saying what was the real kernel there, it wasn't the whole aspect of it, there was some, some part of the truth that was there that's applicable now and was true, w applicable for that time and circumstance, and now no longer is because we're in a different time and circumstance. Um, as, as with regard to why don't we just study alone, I think that, a, I'll tie it back into councils, but that's part of the earthly experience. I think there is something about interacting with other mortal beings and maybe even other celestial beings that facilitates learning and, and, and inspiration. That's why I say when, when councils facilitate that, I think when people are in alignment, in unity with each other, it increases the ability of the Holy Ghost to influence them individually. And I think that's one of the powers of counseling. So let me, so j just so there's some practical advice out of all this, let me, let me suggest three things and, and we can have discussions about these as well, but use this one as the first one. To have a successful council, there are, there are a whole bunch of them, but I'm just going to pick three of them that I think are the most important, um, in part because they relate to scriptures. The first thing is everyone has to have the ability to speak equally on every topic. That is an important one. In the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 122, and this, this goes a little bit to to the question about why don't we do this alone, appoint among yourselves a teacher. Let not all be spokesmen at once, but let one speak at a time, and let all listen unto his sayings, that when all have spoken, when all have spoken, that all may be edified of all. Now that's one, and I'll tell you, this has been um, a challenge for me, and that I probably is still working at for reasons that will become obvious once I say it, which is, I, I talk a lot. And I'm used to thinking out loud a lot. And I've been in councils at which, especially if you trust people, I say some of the craziest ideas in, in the world, but it's really helpful because they're, they're, I'm, I don't worry that I'm going to have to defend this, that I can just say, you know, now that I've talked that out, said that, that was dumb. Let's move on to something else. But it takes having in the right environment. But what I found now, so I'm used to doing it that way. What I found now as president of the university and sitting in these councils is I have to bite my tongue because I found too often, once I speak, everybody thinks their job is to line up and follow what I've just said. And this is a serious problem. I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this. I just have to listen more, and I, I process things by thinking out loud, and I'm, I, I want to jump in and say, well, what about this? What about that? What about that? I found too often what happens, members of the council start trying to guess where, what I've got in my mind, and they think their role now is to pair it back to me what I'm thinking. So sometimes I just, I really do want to add something, but I think I'm not quite sure where I'm headed yet. And I've got, it's probably good for me to be disciplined th this way. So I'm, I'm just going to think a little bit more before I say something, because once I say th something, as much as I tell people, look, this is what I'm doing, it takes them a while, and it's in any culture, but particularly in the LDS culture, when you've got a leader who, who you think is saying something that we want to be obedient, you have to be careful as, as a leader of an organization to say, you don't want to weigh in too early until you're really sure what you say is kind of what you want to have happen. And this, that, that, that's important, again, back to this principle of saying all should speak so that all can be edified of all. I really think, and it's back to this thing again, in a group setting, inspiration can come relevant to that group much better if everybody's speaking on everything. The church is doing better than it did before. Elder Ballard's been at this for a long time. He's finally convinced in the church handbook of instruction, if you want to read another really good thing about leadership, go read section three of that second book of church handbook of instruction and section four about councils. Three is leadership, four is councils. But it talks in there about at the ward council saying, people attend the ward council in two, in two capacities. First, as a full member of the, of the council, and second, as a representative of their organization. And too often in the church, we've gotten that exactly backwards. And some of you, you know, you're old enough, many of you to have been in a ward council, and what typically has happened in the past, and hopefully is being faded away, is you sit there, and if you're the Relief Society president, you sit there and they discuss something with young men's and young women's, and you say nothing. And then when it comes time to say, okay, what's happening in the Relief Society, you give your piece, and then you go back to saying nothing. That, that's wrong. I mean, you, you need to present things about Relief Society, and it's not just women who do this. When it's the Elders Quorum president, the Elders Quorum president waits until it's the Elders Quorum. But the idea is, no, everybody speaks on everything. And there's a real emphasis, I won't go through it in the church having a strong saying, no, that's really what we mean. And you want to have the input of the primary president on what's happening with the young men. 
because they have, for all the reasons we talked about, they've got a different perspective. They think about it differently. If you've seen in, in, um, the training on the Sabbath day worship, about Sabbath day worship in church, you may have noticed, and again, I was there when this was done live, they had a, they had a council, if you will, of various leaders, and, and, the, and the priesthood brethren stood up and, and said, you know, here's the things to think about. And then I remember Sister Wixom from the primary said, let's think about what church sacrament meeting looks like to a five-year-old. And she said, so you're sitting there with the people that you love the most. You don't know what's going on other than the people you love the most are sitting next to you and they won't, don't want to talk to you. And all of a sudden, that whole discussion took an entirely different thing that my guess is, if it had just been left to those who were general authorities on their own, that discussion never would have happened. And it wasn't necessarily even about what happened in primaries, it was about what happens in sacrament meeting. And just use that as an example to say, really, we want everybody to understand they need to speak about everything. One other insight that may or may not be helpful, but it came to me, and this, these are always things I wish I'd known when I was younger. I failed to appreciate as a counselor in both the President's Council and as a counselor in various church organizations, how important counsel from counselors is to the President or the person who makes the ultimate decision. And I found that I had, as I realized this, I had to explain to my counselors what was going on. Because often, as the head of the council, someone would say something and all of a sudden, I would know what the answer was. And it wasn't what they said. But what they said allowed me to look at the problem from a different angle. And it was as if Tumblr sort of clicked, and all of a sudden, it became clear what needed to be said. Now, I started thinking about this as a, how the counselors thought about this, because I said, that's really helpful. But what they had said was Y. And I said, that's really helpful. The answer is X. And so keep telling me all these suggestions. I'm sure they were sort of confused, like, but, but, but you didn't adopt what I said. But it was what they said that facilitated that inspiration coming. And so I said, you just don't know how helpful it is. Just say what's on your mind. That will make all the difference in the world. And what you say in, is, may not be the answer, but it will be a piece of the puzzle that allows the answer to become clear through inspiration or even through logic sometimes. As I say, often it, it is just sort of thinking about it in a different way and saying, OK, now that I look at it from this angle, I can see exactly what the problem is or what the, what the right answer is. That all comes from, again, this principle of making sure everyone speaks. And you have to, if you have, because people are different personalities. You have people who are willing to speak up in group settings. You have people who are hesitant to. And as a leader, one of the things, if you have a regular council, a good practice is call on people by name and say, so-and-so, you know, John, what do you think? You haven't said much more. What are you thinking? And, and quite often, they'll need a little help sometimes because they may be more introverted, and they'll say, well, it doesn't matter. And you say, no, it really does. Tell us what you think. Um, and, and, and it's important to try and encourage that kind of environment. And again, you have to make it so that people don't become defensive. They don't think they're going to be attacked. They don't think if you can get people to where they're just not worried about whose idea wins, Councils work a whole lot better if they're really interested in the, solving the overall problem. So one of the things I struggle with is like the feeling that you need like officials in the council, and that when you have everyone participating, it seems inefficient. It just takes a really long time to kind of get anywhere. So, and like I don't know how to. Like, I guess that's a, a shift that I need to make in my council, from my perspective. Yeah, because there isn't, and, and the comment is again, there, there's some trade-off in efficiency when you counsel, particularly if you're encouraging everyone to speak. Now, I don't think on every topic everybody needs to say something. But I think, again, they ought to feel free to, if they have something to say. And you ought to encourage them enough that they do feel free to do that. But, but, but they don't have to, so you don't have to just check the box and say, well, let's see, everybody, have you said something on this topic? You, you have to allow it to happen. There, it, it is, the answer to the efficiency is, is, is maybe even contradictory, twofold. One is, um, there are a lot of things we do in life that are inefficient that have larger gains in other aspects. And, and it's by allowing people to have experience. I was just reflecting with someone today in some earlier remarks saying, when I had teenage children, I quickly learned if I wanted to get something done around the house, just do it myself. It's faster. <laughs> but if I was more concerned about developing children, then it was a really good way to do it, even though the task may take a little bit longer. And I think our Heavenly Father's a lot like that with us in terms of saying we, 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 
work with each other, and they may not be the most efficient to re reach a particular decision, but the overall outcome is going to be really efficient in terms of accomplishing what we hope to accomplish in, in the long run. You have to look at that. And I think there are some efficiencies that come on the whole from having an environment that's created by more discussion in which you're going to get better answers that in the long run lead you to more efficiencies, if that makes sense um, as well. So that's point number one. Point number two, uh, 107th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 27, says this, speaking of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the First Presidency, every decision made by either of these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make those decisions of the same power or validity. Now, that's a challenging one. I will say, in a church setting, I think that's an ironclad rule. Uh, and it certainly is applied by the members of the Quorum of the Twelve in the First Presidency. They do not proceed until they have, they're all in agreement. I think in an organization, to the extent that's the ideal, there will be times at which you're going to have to make a decision you usually have to make a decision in, in, as a leader, and not everybody may be in agreement. Hopefully, you've created an environment of trust enough that they say, we're going to go forward with this. But I would work pretty hard at the outset, particularly, to get as much as you can unanimity about a decision, because there is great power in that. Elder I President Irene, he was Elder Irene at the time, told a story. It was actually at, I think, an annual conference here at the university. It's in, it's in his biography, which he talks about the very first time that he appeared at a meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve, not as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, in fact, not as a general authority. I think he was commissioner of church education at the time. And, and he appeared before that. It may have been President of Ricks. I've forgotten anyway. It was the President of Ricks. The first time he appeared, he was not a member of the council, but he had an item four that included the entire members of the Quorum of the Twelve. And he stayed after. They had him stay after for whatever the next item was to be discussed. And he said, the item, the, whatever the issue was, he didn't say what it was, it was put out, and he said the first thing that surprised him is how frank yet civil the members of the Corman 12 were with each other. They did not instantly agree on what, how this should be resolved. That was a bit of a surprise, and I think we sometimes think, you know, you put it out there, they all think alike, and let me assure you, they do not. They start with different perspectives. He said, I, I was surprised. They, they spoke warmly, lovingly to each other, but they disagreed. That was point number one for him. Then he said what happened is he said he, he could see it moving toward what he thought, this is where they're going to end up. And as a background, I'll just say, President Iron, as you may know, has his PhD in, in business and organizational behavior from Harvard, taught at Stanford. And this was his area, was corporate governance, how organizations work. And, and you can almost see him there thinking, okay, hey, this is great. I'm now seeing this thing that will apply in a corporate setting, you know, taking notes, everything else. He said, so I, I thought I was watching this miracle as these people who had started out here are going to end up somewhere where they're all in the same place. And then he said, then came the real miracle. Harold B. Lee, who was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, just said, brethren, I sense that somebody here is not settled. We're going to hold this over until the next meeting. And he says, they went out, one of the senior brethren leaned over and said, thank you. I still had some concerns I couldn't articulate, but... I want to think about them. And they were determined, until everybody's on board, they're not moving forward, even though from an outsider's point of view, you could look at them and say, OK, we know where this is going to end up. He just said, no, we don't, until everybody agrees. And just as a footnote again, sort of the, the, the Sunday school lesson part of this to say, you can be assured then when things come out from the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, they are well vetted. These are not off on some flyers. And these are people who, again, are, in, are used to talking and having their opinions valued and doing it. And, and, and you can pretty well sure, be assured they've been thought through very thoroughly before that. So let everyone speak, unanimity in all things, and then I'll give you the last one. Um, from the leader standpoint, I'll call it don't delegate, don't, don't allow people to delegate up. From the counselor standpoint, it is don't delegate up. Sometimes, well, let me explain what that means. Sometimes in an organization, uh, it's, it's easy, in fact, in, in any role in which you're providing a counselor, to say, let me, as you come in with a problem as a counselor or a vice president or something like that, and say, here's the issue. If we do A, this will be the consequences. If we do B, this will be the consequences. Now, which would you like us to do? And you think you're given the very best, you know, you're being deferential, you've given them the exp explanation. That is not as helpful a model as when you come in and do exactly both of those things, say here's example A, I mean here's solution A, all the ramifications, here's solution B, all the ramifications, and say, let me tell you what I recommend. 
and provide a solution. And be prepared to say, thank you for that recommended solution, but, but no thanks, I'm not going to do that, and not have, be offended by that. But it is so much more helpful to have somebody come in and say, I, I'm going to treat this as if my, it's my own problem that I'm bringing to you, and here's, what I, here's how I would solve it. There are all kinds of gains from that. One is it forces you as an individual to think more deeply about the problem. Because if you really have to decide, and I can tell you that's the difference between being a vice president and president, you, you have to decide, you think a little more deeply about it than when you're the vice president and say, hey, it could be A or B, and you know what? You're the one that's going to get the phone calls and letters, so do whatever you want to do. <laughs> uh, then, then if you think, no, this really is mine. In law school, I'm trying to think if I could explain this short enough period of time to make sense. In law school, everything rides on a final exam that's typically an essay exam in which they say, there's a factual situation, and it'll always typically end with saying, who can sue whom for what, and who will win? And I tell students in doing the, the analysis, I said, at the end of the day, there is not a right answer, and you will get zero points for whether you, you say th this side will win or that side will win. Because what I'm looking for are the arguments on favor of this side that you recognize those, and the arguments on the other side, you recognize all those. But then I tell them, this is probably just confuses them, but I want you to answer the question, who will win? Because what I found is if you feel like you have to give that answer, you go one more layer of analysis deeper before, because you have to reconcile these two really good arguments together and you start thinking more deeply about it. And the mere act of saying, I've got to come up with a solution, I've got to explain somehow how this evenly balanced case is going to come out in favor of one side or the other, that will yield more points on the exam because you're going to give better analysis from that even though you really get zero points for the right answer to, the, to that ultimate question. That's, again, this idea of, 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 of if you want to call it, owning the, the idea as a member of the council and saying, what would you do? And not being offended, not becoming territorial in a council setting when, when, when the leader says, well, well, what's your recommendation? And you say what it is, and then you think through it a little bit, and it may be right, it may be wrong, but just that process of doing it is very helpful in, in the long run. Well, let me, we're, we're supposed to be done at 250, right? Okay, so much time, I was going to leave time for questions and answers, but you participated well anyway. L let me just suggest that all of this is a way in which you can learn about enduring principles and applying them in a si situation. I think counseling with councils is one, but I think I would just challenge you to think about the things you learn in your religious ed classes, in your religion classes, how they apply in this and vice versa, how things you apply here. It really is. We, we really do believe that all truth can be reconciled in one thing. That's, that's a really difficult thing. And philosophers and scientists have, some of them literally driven themselves mad trying to figure that out. But it's a true principle that I still don't have the answers to. But I very much believe it is. And if you can sort of holistically blend these together, there's all kinds of interesting connections that come. And, 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 and just again, as I say, if, if you're just sort of looking for a management book that's a really good, easy read and will apply in a lot of settings, Counseling with Counsels from Elder Ballard is a really good one. Um, with that, I, I, I want to thank you for what you do. This is a remarkable place. There is no place like Brigham Young University. With the same students, with the faculty who are committed to this mission, and even the other CES schools, which are good, and they have their own unique features in their own unique way, I'm not discerning. But there is no place like this. Hopefully you not only recognize the opportunities you have to be here and learn, but also the opportunities you have to influence others around you. Because other people watch, and other people feel, and other people will be influenced in ways they will never say anything to you, but you will impact their lives forever if you can come to understand and just do the best at what you're doing. And I'll leave you that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.